periodogram is a method for estimating the power spectrum of a random signal from its samples. The term periodogram was coined by Arthur Schuster, a British physicist in the late 1800s. Now recall that the power spectrum is the discrete time Fourier transform of the correlation sequence. So if we look at how to estimate a power spectrum from samples, we can begin by approximating the correlation sequence from a set of L samples of X of N as the average of the product of X of N times X of N minus K. Because remember that the correlation is defined as the expected value of X of N times X of N minus K. So we'll approximate the expectation by an average over the samples that we have available. So if we plug this definition or this approximation for the correlation sequence into the discrete time for a transform, we have this double sum over k times a, a sum over n, and then x of n, x of n minus k, e to the minus j, k omega, okay, because we're taking the discrete time for a transform with respect to k, which is the sequence index or the time index in R. And then the sum over N is the averaging used to approximate the expectation. Well, we're going to introduce a new variable L as N minus K, and we can substitute this in for the summation. And then we have the sum over L, the sum over N, X of N, X of L, e to the minus J N omega, and then e to the j l omega. And at this point, we can group the terms involving the sum over l and the sum over n. We see that we have the sum over n, x of n, e to the minus j n omega. Well, that's just the discrete time for a transform of x of n. And then again, we have the sum over l, x of l, e to the minus j l times minus omega. So this is the discrete time Fourier transform of X of L evaluated at minus omega. And it turns out, just using the properties of the discrete time Fourier transform, the fact that it's conjugate symmetric, that X of E to the minus J omega is the same as X conjugate of E to the J omega. And we see that this approximation of the correlation sequence leads to describing the power spectrum or an estimate of the power spectrum, which is given by 1 over L times the magnitude of the discrete time for a transform of the L point time series, X of N, squared. So we can take the DFT of our length L data, X of N, and take the magnitude squared, divide by L, the number of data points, and approximate the power spectrum. And that's called the periodogram. So our procedure, in general, goes something like this. We're going to allow for the possibility of using a window rather than simply the rectangular window. Other windows might be desirable, as we've seen when we've done Fourier analysis for uh, deterministic signals. So we'll have a windowed sequence, x w of n, which is w of n times x of n. And again, we'll assume that we have L values of the sequence. We're going to take a DTF or DFT of XW of N. And then we're going to use as our power spectrum estimate the magnitude squared of the DFT coefficients. And we're going to normalize by some quantity F, which is going to depend on the window so that we get the power right. Now, when the window is a rectangular window, we call that the periodogram. And if W of N is any other window, we're going to call that a modified periodogram or a windowed periodogram. In order for the power to match up, the normalization factor F has to be 1 over L, the sum of the squares of the window that we apply to the data. And we would like to know whether this particular estimate is a good estimator or what its qualities are. So we're going to look at the properties of the periodogram, and these have been analyzed, and we're just going to sort of present the results of those analysis rather than go through the details. So we're going to define our periodogram estimate 
as 1 over L times the magnitude squared of x w v to j omega, where x w v to j omega is the discrete time for a transform of the windowed length L time series x of n. We can look at the mean of this estimate. In other words, if we draw many different random time series x of n, on average, what does this estimator look like? And it turns out that it's given by the expression I've shown here. We've got 1 over 2 pi L times F, integral from minus pi to pi SXX of theta, CWW, e to the J, quantity omega minus theta D theta. So this is a convolution. Here we have a convolution between the true underlying power spectrum and this function CWW which is just the magnitude squared of the DATFT of the window function. So the magnitude squared of the window function is going to distort the true power spectrum and that gives us the mean that we obtain. Now as the window length increases then this CWW becomes increasingly concentrated about omega equals zero and what happens is that the mean value of the periodogram converges to the true value of the spectrum. So asymptotically, as L increases, this estimator is unbiased, which is a good thing. For finite L, it has some bias, which is reflected by this window function, and basically the resolution or ability to distinguish details between two frequencies is going to be limited by the window function. So if we have an asymptotic unbiased estimator, we can then look at the variance. And it turns out that under a variety of assumptions, the variance of this periodogram estimator behaves like the square of the true power spectrum, and that's independent of L. So even as L gets big, the variance doesn't decrease, and that we would thus say that the periodogram is not a consistent estimator because a consistent estimator is one where the variance goes to zero as the number of samples L goes toward infinity. Well, this is independent of the number of samples, so this is not a consistent estimator. Now we can look at this effect where the variance is proportional to the square of the true value, and I'm going to display three different trials, and we'll look at several different values of L, and what I'm displaying in this plot is the estimated value SXX of K, where K is my DFT index, and I'm simply plotting 1 over L times the magnitude squared of the DFT of the length L sequence X of N. And in this case, we're going to use N, though we only have L samples, we're going to use of the time series, we're going to use a 1024 point DFT. And I'm going to depict the results as a continuous curve because there's quite a few samples here. And we're only going to show, since this is a real valued time series, the periodogram and the true power spectrum are symmetric about zero. So I'm only going to plot the first half of the DFT coefficients here. So this is when L is equal to 64, and you can see the true power spectrum is given by this red line, and I chose a true spectrum that decreased to zero. It started at one, and then it decreased gradually to zero. You can see that most of the variability, or the variance, is at the lower frequencies where the true power spectrum is larger. As we get up here, where the true power spectrum goes to zero, the variance gets smaller, and that's in agreement with the fact that the variance is given by the square of the true value. So if the true value goes to zero, the variance is going to go to zero. Well, this effect doesn't change as L changes. Here's a case where L is equal to 256, and you can see that I still have fairly high variance at the low frequencies, and then that variance decreases at the high frequencies where the true value of the power spectrum goes to zero. And then for the last case, we'll look at L equals 1024. 
And what you see is that, again, the variance behaves almost identical to that we observed with the L equals 256 and L equals 64 case, that it's proportional to the square of the true underlying power spectrum. We do have increased resolution that is associated with using more data. That is, the bias gets re reduced in this case, but the variance continues to be very large, and this poses a problem for the periodogram as a practical estimator. And before we conclude, we're going to talk just a little bit about the units. And normally, and I'll refer to the standard that MATLAB uses in its periodogram function, the power spectrum is displayed as a density. So the units on that would be watts, or dB if we convert it to a decibel scale, divided by the frequency units being used. So if, if you're going to display the power spectrum in terms of discrete time frequency, lowercase omega, the units are going to be watts divided by radians per sample, because these are the frequency units for omega. Or if you're going to display it as a function of continuous time frequency f, the units would be watts per hertz. And furthermore, the amplitude of the power spectrum estimate is normally is normalized, typically, so that the area under the curve is equal to the total power in the signal. So this changes the amplitude depending on what one displays for the power spectrum estimate. So if we're going to display the power spectrum as a function of discrete time frequency omega, we're going to represent it over the entire 2 pi interval, then the power spectrum takes the form 1 over 2 pi times L times the magnitude squared of the DFT. And in this case, we've got the normalization by L, but we've also got a normalization by 2 pi because that's the width of this interval. On the other hand, if we only want to display the power spectrum between 0 and pi, because, for example, the signal x is real, and thus the power spectrum has to be even function of omega, so we'll only display half of it, then we only normalize by pi rather than 2 pi when we compute sxx hat of omega. Similarly, if we're going to display it as a function of frequency f, ranging, say, from 0 to half the sampling frequency. In that case, we're going to normalize by F sub S over 2 when we compute the power spectrum. So converting these in terms of DFT coefficients X of K, what we're going to have is, in the case where we were interested in SXX of omega between 0 and 2 pi, we'll have sxx of k times 2 pi divided by n, where n is the length of the DFT, and in general n can be greater than L if we do zero padding, and we'll have a length n DFT x of k, so we take the magnitude squared of that and then normalize by 2 pi L. On the other hand, if we're only interested in representing the power spectrum between 0 to pi, we're going to take the length n DFT coefficients magnitude squared and then divide by L times pi and in this case we're only displaying for values of K from 0 to N over 2 minus 1 and in writing it this way we're just assuming for convenience that N is even. And then finally in the case where we want to look at things as a function of F or frequency in Hertz we're going to have SSX of k times fs over n, that'll give us the frequency, and we'll normalize by L times fs over 2, which means this multiplier up front is 2 over fs times L, and then the magnitude squared of the DFT coefficients, and this particular normalization assumes we're only displaying from 0 to n over 2 minus 1. So this normalization issue can sometimes be confusing but it basically follows these two principles that we're trying to display a density
and we're assuming that the area under the power spectrum that we actually display is equal to the total power in the signal. So the periodogram has a nice property that it's asymptotically unbiased, but the, the fact that the variance is generally proportional to the square of the true power spectrum is problematic and most of the time when we actually estimate a power spectrum we're going to use modifications on this periodogram idea in order to reduce the variance.